from last semester, what is that? Uh, normally, you, from uh, the carboxyl end, that we normally count. I'm going to leave the hydrogens off, except over here at the end. But with the omega numbers, instead of this being carbon 1, 2, 3, and so forth, they're counting from the methyl group. So this is carbon 1, 2, 3. So this would be an omega 3. Okay. Uh, if it's an omega-6, then the first carbon-carbon double bond from the, um, from the methyl group would be at carbon number 6, between 6 and 7. So that's what these mean. Uh, so uh, we can, if I, in our diet, we have long-chain um, unsaturated uh, fatty acids that are omega-3s and omega-6s, we can make shorter-chain ones. But other than that, these we have to get in our diet. So something that's common in our diet is um, alpha linoleic acid. If you remember from last semester, 18, this is the structural formula, means that it consists of 18 carbons, and it has three carbon-carbon double bonds. Last semester, I'd also put up here a delta and give the numbers counting from the um, carboxyl end where those uh, carbon carbon double bonds are, but here we're not going to worry about that. Uh, we're only worried about the omega. So this is an omega-3, but it has two other, two other carbon carbon double bonds. And then linoleic acid, it's also 18 carbons long. How it differs from alpha linoleic acid is that this only has two carbon carbon double bonds. And so these are essential. We can get them in our diet and we can use them to make others. Something else that's also essential is EPA, icosal pentadenoic acid. It's 20, and it is polyunsaturated, but it is still an omega-3. Something that's similar to it is uh, DHA, uh, glucosahexaenoic acid, and it is 22, and it has six carbon-carbon double bonds, therefore it's polyunsaturated, but it is also a carbon uh, a omega-3. And so we can make very, very limited amounts of these. Okay, but so we really need to get more in our diet. Uh, both of these are very, very important for neurons in the central nervous system, they're in plasma membranes. So we do have central amino acids. Uh, the real problem with our fatty diets is really the ratio of unsaturated fatty acids to saturated. It really should be something like one to three, okay? But our diets are more like one to 10, one to 12. We have lots of saturated fatty acids uh, and too little unsaturated fatty acids. So vitamins, this is a motley group of uh, various compounds. And the only thing that really defines them is that it is an essential nutrient, an organic essential nutrient that we can eat in very, very small quantities much less than the quantities we need for essential fatty acids, much less than what we need for essential uh, amino acids as well. Uh, as far as their molecular makeup, they're varied. Uh, some of them, especially the B vitamins, they form coenzymes or they're precursors of coenzymes and cat cat uh, catabolic, uh, catalytic functions, uh, especially the B vitamins. Of course, the deficiencies they can cause even though we eat very little of them, they can still be, uh, have severe consequences if there's a deficiency. Uh, they're divided into water-soluble and lipid-soluble. The water-soluble ones are all B vitamins and vitamin C, okay? These, uh, and vitamins are not stored. Just like amino acids, you use them or you lose them, okay? And uh, they can't be stockpiled, and so they are equally lost in the urine. And as a consequence, you would have to have a very, very massively high dose ever to have any sort of toxicity because they're eliminated pretty fast, okay? That's a little bit different with the water-soluble ones, or the, the lipid-soluble ones. Vitamin A, vitamin D, E, and K, these are lipids, and therefore they're hydrophobic. Therefore, they can get into cell membranes and membranes within cells, and they can build up However, even here, it requires quite a bit uh, for them to become toxic, all right? 
It is possible, however. Vitamin D, even though it's traditionally classified as a vitamin, in actuality, it is a hormone. Okay? And when I get into uh, endocrine systems a little bit later on, you'll understand why I'm saying that it is actually a hormone. It is a hormone in its active state, changing uh, gene expression. Okay? So, uh, if the body can't make it, if the body can make it, it's not an end, it's not a vitamin. Now, many animals require the same vitamins, but vitamin C is a vitamin for many pigs and primates, including ourselves, but it's not for other animals. Other animals can make it, and therefore it's not a vitamin. Okay, so you don't need to know this list. I'm just pointing out some of the important vitamins. All these are the B vitamins and uh, where they come from, what their functions are, and that I will never ask you to memorize these. Also, for the eight essential amino acids, I don't expect you to know them. Uh, on an exam, I would tell you, if I'm asking for net amino acid utilization, I'd be telling you which ones in my list up there are the essential amino acids. I just want you to know that there's eight of them, okay? All right, okay, so uh, minerals. Okay, this is another thing you get in our diet, and in this case, we're not any different than plants. The plants require some of minerals too. These are all inorganic. Uh, however, in animals, some of these minerals might perform different types of functions compared to what they might serve in plants. Uh, some of them for structure, okay, calcium, potassium. Uh, they're parts of the mineralization of our bones. Okay, because that's calcium phosphate. Phosphate's in there too. Uh, some of them are electrolytes to maintain osmotic balance between the uh, fluid inside of the cell and the fluid outside of the cell so that they may able to neither shrink nor um, collapse. That's primarily potassium, sodium, chlorine. Some of these are important cofactors, inorganic cofactors of certain types of human bones. So magnesium. Magnesium is very important for kinases. Remember what kinases are. Talked last semester a lot about kinases. What are kinases? It's a big group, different enzymes, but what do they do in general? Okay, phosphorylation reductions. Okay, yes, they're involved in that. Uh, copper, that's important uh, for a few enzymes. Iron is uh, probably of these. This is the one we need the highest amount. Uh, not only is it a cofactor for some enzymes, such as oxidases, oxidases is a big group, uh, but it's also uh, for carrier proteins such as hemoglobin, for carrier oxygen. In fact, most of the iron requirements we have is actually for hemoglobin. Zinc is very important for some enzymes as well. And so uh, those are some of the important things we need in our diet. Now, as far as animal nutrition, uh, a lot of times we like to categorize animals by what they eat, okay? Uh, traditionally, we always did this by food types. So herbivore eats plants, a carnivore eats other animals, omnivore eats both, but that doesn't exhaust everything. And it's sort of simple and uh, put up there a fungivore. What do you think a fungivore would be? Fungi, okay, all right? But uh, this is sometimes useful, but a better uh, category, way of categorizing what animals are doing is by the mechanism by which they feed, okay? For example, some of these are suspension feeders. Up to now, I've been calling this filter feeders, same thing. So uh, like clams and uh, sponges, Okay, they're filtering large volumes of water and removing nutrients from them. But some of these filter feeders can, and suspension feeders can be pretty big. Baleen whales, they swim through the water with their mouth open and they have special uh, baleen structures to filter out the water and take out the krill and other small things in, in the uh, food. Others are substrate feeders. They live in their food, like maggots, okay? And other things that are parasites, like uh, uh, nematodes. So nematodes are living inside of animal bodies, but you 
also have them go swimming inside of uh, plant bodies as well. And so these are substrate feeders. Uh, there's fluid field feeders, mosquitoes, and leeches, etc. blood. But plants have their own versions of these types of critters, such as aphids, and uh, even hummingbirds. They're drinking nectar. Therefore, they are uh, fluid feeders, and the bees, fluid feeders as well. Uh, some humans on Friday nights are also pretty big fluid feeders as well. Right? But mostly we are bulk feeders. That's our main category. This you take large chunks of thing out of some other creature's body, or might swallow the other creature's body off body altogether and then digest it. So these are the feeding categories. Okay. Now all of this material can't be used in the body unless it's broken down into the basic building blocks. So all the carbohydrates have to be broken down into simple or monosaccharides of some sort. Uh, lipids have to be broken down, fatty acids and uh, glycerol. Uh, nucleic acids into nucleotides, and even further than that, into bases, pinto sugar and phosphate, and so forth, before it can ever be used in the body and be constructed. So this happens in a digestive compartment of some sort. All right? So, uh, and only in the periphery do we have intracellular digestion as the only means, as the only means of nutrient procurement. Okay? So they are filter feeders, but they have no digestive compartment. Things are taken in by phagocytosis, endocytosis into an exosome. The exosome will then fuse with a lysosome, primary lysosome, by uh, the food backhole or food lysosome which would be breaking, breaking down. So all other animals' digestion is extracellular, just as it is in plant food. Okay, the difference between our extracellular digestion and plant food extracellular digestion is that we take the food into a compartment that we surround, and it's broken down there, but it's outside of ourselves. So we're putting into the compartment hydrolytic enzymes, that uh, still the compartment's continuous, at least with one opening to the outside. Okay, so uh, some animals that we have covered, uh, Platyhelminthes, Nigeria, they have a gastrovascular cavity. So this is where uh, things are digested and any sort of non-digestible material is then ejected through the very same opening. And uh, so this gastrovascular cavity functions both as digestive area, and once the nutrients are broken down into the basic building blocks, then it can be distributed throughout the body. Because uh, like in the platyhelm methods, that's, uh, that gastrovascular cavity is highly branching, okay, so that no cell inside of the body is going to be further away from the gastrovascular cavity than the fusion rate, okay, so that things can be transferred. Okay, so uh, that's one, platyhelm methods and nigeria. All others have animals, bilaterians, have uh, an elementary canal. Okay, so this has two openings, and this allows food to be moved through it in one direction, from one end to the other, and this type of movement can allow for regional specialization. Okay, certain compartments along the elementary canal can perform certain digestive tasks in that region, which you cannot get that type of specialization with the gastrovascular cavity, because everything is everywhere. Okay? Alright, so and we've seen some of these with in lab. You dissected an earthworm. Uh, the digestive system is relatively straight, not longer than the worm itself. Uh, you also saw that in uh, cockroach. However, this here is not completely straight. The digestive system is longer than the body, and therefore the uh, mid-gut was highly coiled, and like in birds and so forth, okay, uh, provides various regions where various types of tasks have to occur, and I will be concentrating on mostly mammals and how that works. And so this is true of all other phytotherian foods that we've been talking about. Okay. All right, 
So the digestive process, getting into it, these are the steps to congestion. That's getting it into the digestive cavity of some sort. Okay, so it's a, again, the rest of the cavity, we call that eating. Then our food is digested. That means breaking it down into smaller pieces, ultimately, ultimately into molecules or base building blocks. And so this digestion can involve mechanical disruption and enzymatic disruption. Okay, both happen. Right? Mechanical fragmentation, we chew, and we're some of the rare animals that chew. Okay, most other animals just swallow. So they don't they have teeth, like uh, a snake, a lizard, they have teeth. They don't chew with that. They just use their teeth to hold their prey and struggle to try to get away from them while most of them swallow. Okay, uh, chewing is a mammal thing. Okay, uh, and then there's enzymatic hydrolysis, and that happens all throughout the system. Okay, this is where hydrolytic enzymes that are very specialized to hydrolyze linkages between basic building blocks. Then absorption. This is a transporting of those molecules from the digestive cavity into the circulatory system or at least out of it into the body of the animal. And really, technically, as long as those materials are in the alimentary canal, they really are outside of you. We usually don't like to look at it that way. It's inside of you, but really, it isn't in your body until it crosses that epithelium that surrounds uh, the cavity, digestive cavity, and brought into places in the body where it can be moved and utilized. Then the third, fourth part is elimination. Uh, no animal can digest everything. Okay, so there are undigestible components that uh, just simply have to go straight through. And so that's elimination. Often in common language, you use this word excretion and elimination, almost like uh, that, that they're synonyms. Then in bio biology here, there's a big separation between elimination is forming feces, getting rid of the material that is never inside your bloodstream to begin with. Elimination is getting rid of metabolic waste that were, that were created inside of your body. So these are not the same thing. Okay, all right. So uh, I'm only going to talk about the mammalian digestive system. In lab, we've looked at the system in shark and um, frog and later on we'll look at pigs, um, very similar. So this is the alimentary canal plus accessory glands. So most of the alimentary canals that I mentioned already consists of four tissue layers. Four tissue layers, okay? Example here is the stomach that's also true of other um, intestine. This inner layer, which is usually a simple columnar epithelium. It's an epithelium that faces the lumen. Uh, the digestive system is called the mucosa. Underneath it is a connective tissue that is called the submucosa. Okay, I mentioned that. And then we have all these layers of smooth muscle. The function of the smooth muscle is to churn and mix the material inside of the alimentary canal and also to propel it the system as well in its program. And so we have that smooth muscle, and then on the outside, uh, there's another layer of connective tissue, and you don't need to know this word over here, okay, or the serosa. You just need to, these two words you don't need. These two I'd like you to know, okay. All right, so then along here, so the movement is of contraction of the smooth muscle that squeezes food along as a ball of material is called peristalsis. And it is, this is under complete involuntary control. It's controlled by uh, a nervous system that is actually local in your digestive system itself with very little input from the brain. The brain may modify it a little bit, but very little. It's almost like your digestive system has its own diffuse nerve net. It is a nerve net and it um, has its own control system. Furthermore, there are muscular valves that will constrict. So in the shark, 
and from we looked at the pylori valve. That is the junction between the stomach and the first part of the small intestine. Because uh, things have to stay in the stomach until they've been processed to a certain degree before they can be released into the next part of the digestive system. So there's sphincters there. Uh, there's also a sphincter right here between the stomach and the esophagus, the gastroesophageal sphincter. And this thing sometimes fails. When it sometimes fails, what happens is that some of the churning of the stomach will put acid chyme up into your esophagus and you experience something that is called heartburn. Uh, in the stomach, you don't feel that, okay, because it's protected, but the acid that gets on the esophagus, it's, it, it hurts and you experience that. Okay, so besides the alimentary canal, there are also accessory glands that put components, fluid, into, added to the food that you eat. So in the mouth, there are salivary glands, and there's several of them. And uh, pancreas is a organ that lies right in the fold between the stomach and the first part of the small intestine, and it puts all sorts of stuff into the small intestine. Furthermore, there's a liver and gallbladder. The gallbladder only stores material that comes from the liver. And this is called bile and bile salts. And so the liver is making the bile, bile salts, storing it in this uh, gallbladder. And under the appropriate signals, <clears throat> then the gallbladder will empty through the duct, little tube, into the small intestine. The first part of the small intestine. The function of bile, we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay. So we're going to take a journey now from mouth to anus. Okay, so we're going to go all the way through and see what happens with all of your food. You start in the oral cavity, it's also called the buccal cavity, <clears throat> where you have mechanical fragmentation. You're breaking it up into smaller pieces. As I said, as mammals, we do chewing. Uh, other animals usually do not. Okay, so what this fragmentation does, it increases the surface area of the food for enzymatic attack. Okay, because any enzymes that you put on there can only attack from the surface. And so if you have a big chunk, that's how you eat your food, it's going to take a long time to digest it because it's being digested from the surface anyway. But when you break it up into a bunch of bunch of smaller pieces, then the process is much faster. Okay? So, and we mix it with saliva. So uh, you salivate on average about a liter a day. Okay? If you don't believe me, get yourself a graduated cylinder, take the day off, and for 24 hours just sit there and drool into it, okay, and see how much you can accumulate. Right? And uh, this contains a glycoprotein called mucin. <clears throat> okay, so glycoprotein is a protein that is glycosylated. It has a bunch of sugar units uh, on it that makes it slippery. So you're mixing that with your food and uh, makes it easier to swallow. Okay, because when you swallow it, there's still friction. Still friction, but once all this has been well coated, it goes down pretty well unless you chew, you don't spend too much time chewing your food, you just swallow it, all right? Furthermore, the first enzymatic components start uh, digestion and start here. The saliva also contains an enzyme called amylase. Okay, this, we have two different forms of amylase. They're isoforms, isoenzymes, and uh, one of them is produced by salivary gland cells. The other one is in in the uh, pancreas. We'll get to that a little bit later on. So this hydrolyzes starch and glycogen, both of which are just polymers of glucose. If, if you mix this salivary amylase with glycogen or starch and let it set there to let the reaction go to completion, you would not have glucose. You would have maltose because it hydrolyzes every other, every other And so this is not enough 
break everything down. Furthermore, you don't keep it in your mouth long enough to form maltose, except for some. Mostly what you're doing is breaking it down into shorter and shorter fragments of polysaccharides, okay? And then when you swallow it, nothing happens in the esophagus, okay? So your tongue will sort of fold this into a ball, it's called a food bolus, or you swallow it. Then when you swallow it, it goes from the oral cavity into the pharynx, so the pharynx is a passageway for both air and food, okay? It's a passageway for both air and food. Even if you breathe through your nose, your air will eventually go into the pharynx, okay? And uh, therefore, to keep things from going down the wrong passageway, they, they bifurcate. At the end of the pharynx, there's an esophagus that goes to a pipe that goes to the stomach, and a trachea that goes to your lungs. So this food can go in two different directions, one of which is appropriate. The other one leads to choking, okay? So there is a flap of uh, tissue that, well, the opening to the trachea is called a glottis, but it's covered by a flap of skin that usually when you swallow, or, or flap of tissue, that when you swallow, it pushes the glottis up and the other glottis down, and this covers it so that the trachea, so that the food goes into the esophagus, okay? If you are talking and swallowing at the same time, however, things can go wrong, and it'll go into the wrong place and uh, you can choke, okay? Once into the esophagus, okay, because after that, esophagus, so our passageway here is uh, oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, okay? Esophagus, by peristalsis, has smooth muscles that will contract, pushing all the food down, okay, into the stomach. Nothing happens to the food in the esophagus. The esophagus has no secretions that it adds. In the stomach, on average, for a human, this can store about, uh, it's stretchable, it can store about two liters of material. And uh, the cells, the epithelial cells, they produce what is called gastric juice, which includes cells that secrete hydrochloric acid. Okay, that uh, brings the pH down here to about two. So the pH in the stomach, very acidic. And uh, this here, <coughs> the acid, uh, the acid hydrolysis of extracellular matrix in the food, connective tissue, they break down the matrix. Also, most bacteria do not survive in an acidic uh, environment. Some can, okay, but uh, most of them are killed. This is one of the functions here. Furthermore, <clears throat> this here is the first part where protein digestion begins. There are other cells in the epithelium that release a, an active proteinase called pepsinogen. It's a proteinase. Proteinase is hydrolyzed to meet uh, peptide linkages. However, not every peptide linkage. It depends on the two amino acids on each side of that peptide linkage. Certain enzymes will digest one form. For example, if the upstream amino end of the linkage contains lysine and the next uh, amino acid can be anything else then there's a particular amino acid, a particular proteinase that would only cut that, okay? So pepsinogen, pepsin, the active form is sort of like that. This is inactive. To activate it, the active form is pepsin. So pepsinogen becomes pepsin. Now, to lead to that, uh, it requires a combination change. And that's by acid hydrolysis of a particular bond by the hydrochloric acid. So that's another function of the hydrochloric acid to lead to the hydrolysis of a peptide bond, which leads to a conformational change, turning pepsinogen into the active form, pepsin. <clears throat> Why would you want to do that? Why does that make sense? Uh, so the, 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 
and this is active inside the cells and gives you more like protein. Okay. So you don't want to have any protein to get rid of the stuff. All right. Now, what happens to carbohydrate digestion once it gets here in the stomach? We already started that with salivary amylase. What happens here? What can you tell me what happens to the action of salivary amylase? As long as that food source is still there, it, you mix it, right? Saliva mixes it all into a big ball, so there's saliva on the inside and amylase on the inside. As long as it's not in an acid, it's going to keep working. But eventually, your stomach's going to turn all this. And that's protein. Proteins have pH optimum. pH optimum, what do you think the pH optimum of salivary amylase is? Around 7. Maybe 7.3. You think it's going to work here? No, no, it doesn't. So once it gets in contact, we stop. It will work on glycogen to start as long as it's in the interior of the ball, okay, that you mix it into, but, what, but eventually that stomach is going to turn all that to mush, and so we'll mix it all together, and what happens to the protein, the amylase? We just digest it, okay, we break it down into amino acids, and get the amino acids back, it's digestible, okay, all right, so, okay, these are secreted by different cells. The acid, there are certain types of cells that happen in the, the mucosal epithelium, and the um, pepsinogen is secreted by other cells. Okay? Now, you don't need to know where exactly pepsin cuts, but just want you to know is that that was the only protein age you had. You would not be able to completely digest your protein. All you'd be able to do is cut long, strands of protein into shorter pieces. But you wouldn't be able to break it all down into the individual amino acids. Because here it only cuts in certain places between certain amino acids. Okay? Then the stomach, stomach muscles turn, okay, mixing all this stuff together. And then eventually, okay, this is a very hostile place. And so the epithelium here is very unhot. Stem cells that are keep replacing cells. Uh, there are mucus glands that secrete mucus to help protect the cells, but because of the acidity and the digestive enzymes, most of these cells only live for about three days. And so the lining of the stomach is being replaced all the time. So this is acid kind once it's mixed into that mush, and it's a pyloric sphincter, a muscle between the first part of the small intestine of the stomach that prevents any of this acid kind from going into the next part. Okay. Now, this pepsinogen is an example of what cyanogen. I mentioned cyanogen this last semester. Cyanogens are enzymes, that are proteins. It doesn't have to be an enzyme. It's a protein that is made in an inactive form and it requires some sort of cleavage or some bond or complication change to put it in its so we'll find several cyanogens as we go along. This is where I'm going to stop. Okay, but our next point of going is we've made it to the stomach. The only thing we've done is partly broken down our carbohydrates, partly broken down our uh, proteins, but we're not done. The rest of it happens in the small intestine. Okay. All right, this is where I'll stop for today.